It is a pleasure to welcome uh, Prime Minister Yatsenia to the Oval Office, to the White House. I think all of us uh, have seen the courage of the Ukrainian people in standing up on behalf of democracy uh, and on you know, the desire that I believe is universal for people to be able to determine their own destiny. Uh, and we saw in the Maidan uh, uh, how ordinary people uh, from all parts of the country uh, had said that uh, we want to change. Uh, and uh, you know, the Prime Minister was part of that process, uh, showed tremendous courage, and upheld the principles of nonviolence uh, throughout uh, the course of events over the last several months. Uh, obviously, the Prime Minister comes here during a very difficult time for his country. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, President Yanukovych uh, leaving the country, uh, the Parliament, the Rada, acted uh, in a responsible fashion to fill the void, uh, created an uh, inclusive process in which uh, all parties had input, including uh, the party of former President Yanukovych. Uh, they have set forward a process to stabilize the country, take uh, a very deliberate step to uh, assure economic stability and negotiate with the International Monetary Fund, and to schedule early elections so that uh, the Ukrainian people, in fact, can choose uh, their direction for the future. And the Prime Minister uh, has managed that process uh, with great uh, skill and great restraint, and we're very much appreciative of the work that he has done. Uh, the most pressing challenge that Ukraine faces uh, at the moment, however, is the threat to its territorial integrity and its sovereignty. Uh, we have been very clear that we consider uh, the Russian incursion into Crimea outside of its bases uh, to be a violation of international law, uh, of international agreements of which Russia is a signatory, uh, and a violation of the territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty of Ukraine. And we have been very firm in saying that we will stand with Ukraine uh, and the Ukrainian people uh, in ensuring that that territorial integrity and sovereignty is maintained. I think we all recognize that there are historic ties between Russia and Ukraine, and I think the Prime Minister uh, would be the first one to acknowledge that. Uh, and I think the Prime Minister and the current government in Kiev has recognized and uh, has communicated directly to the Russian Federation uh, their desire uh, to try to manage through this process diplomatically. Uh, but what the Prime Minister, I think, has rightly insisted on is, is that they cannot uh, have a country outside of Ukraine dictate to them uh, how they should uh, arrange their affairs. Uh, and that there is a constitutional process in place and a, a set of elections that uh, they can move forward on that, in fact, could uh, lead to different arrangements over time uh, with uh, the Crimean region. Uh, but that is not something that can be done uh, with uh, the barrel of a gun pointed at you. Uh, and so uh, Secretary Kerry is in communications with the Russian government uh, and has offered to uh, try to uh, explore with uh, his counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, a diplomatic solution to this crisis. Uh, we are in close communication with the Ukrainian government in terms of how we might proceed uh, going forward. Uh, but we will continue to say to the Russian government that uh, if it continues on the path that it is on, then not only us, but the international community, uh, the European Union and others uh, will be forced to apply a cost to uh, Russia's uh, violations of international law and its encroachments on Ukraine. Uh, there's another path available, and we hope that uh, President Putin uh, is willing to seize uh, that path. Uh, but uh, if he does not, uh, I'm very confident that the international community will stand strongly behind 
uh, the Ukrainian government uh, in preserving its unity and its territorial integrity. Uh, let me just make uh, two final points. Uh, obviously, because of the political turmoil, uh, the economic situation in Ukraine uh, has become more challenging, not less. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm very proud that not only as critical members of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, we are working with uh, the Prime Minister and his team in a package that can help to institute necessary reforms inside of uh, the Ukraine, uh, but also help to stabilize the situation so that people feel confident that uh, in their daily lives uh, they can meet their basic necessities. Uh, we're also asking Congress to act promptly uh, to deliver on uh, an aid package, including a $1 billion loan guarantee, that can help uh, smooth the path for reform inside of Ukraine uh, and give uh, the Prime Minister and his government the capacity to do what they need to do uh, as they are also organizing uh, an election process. Uh, so I would just ask both Democrats and Republicans, who I know uh, are unified in their support of Ukraine, uh, to move quickly, uh, to give us the support that uh, we need so that we can uh, give uh, the Ukrainian people uh, the support that they need. Uh, and then finally, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I, I would ask that uh, you deliver a message on behalf of the American people uh, to all the Ukrainian people, uh, and that is that we uh, admire their courage, uh, we uh, appreciate their aspirations, uh, the interests of the United States are solely in making sure that the people of Ukraine are able to determine their own destiny. Uh, that is something that uh, here in the United States uh, we believe in deeply. Uh, I know it's something that you believe in deeply as well. Uh, and you can rest assured that uh, you will have our strong support uh, as you move forward uh, during these difficult times. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, we highly appreciate the support that you have given to the Ukrainian people. And my country feels that the United States stands by the Ukrainian people. Mr. President, it's all about the freedom. We fight for our freedom, we fight for our independence, we fight for our sovereignty, and we will never surrender. My country has faced a number of challenges. The military one is a key challenge today. And we urge Russia to stick to its international obligations, to pull back its military into barracks, and to start the dialogue. With no guns, with no military, with no tanks, but with the diplomacy and political tools. On behalf of my government, I would like to reiterate that we are absolutely ready and open for talks with the Russian Federation. We adhere to all international obligations. And we, as the state of Ukraine, will fulfill all bilateral and multilateral international treaties. On the economic side, Mr. President, uh, we highly appreciate the support uh, of the United States and uh, the decision to guarantee $1 billion loans for the Ukrainian economy. You know that we resumed talks with the IMF. We do understand that these are tough reforms but these reforms are needed for the Ukrainian state. And uh, we are back on track in terms of uh, delivering real reforms in uh, my country. As I already informed you, uh, probably in the nearest future, next week or in 10 days, uh, Ukraine is to sign a political part of uh, association agreement with the European Union. And we want to be very clear that Ukraine is and will be a part of the Western world. And our Russian partners are to realize that we are ready to make a new type or to craft a new type of our relationship where Ukraine is a part of the European Union, but Ukraine is a good friend and partner of Russia. So much will depend on whether Russia wants to have this talk and uh, whether Russia wants to have Ukraine as a partner or as a subordinate. As I already indicated, um, we will never surrender and we will do everything in order to preserve peace, stability and independence of my country. 
and we appreciate your personal support, support of your government, support of the U American people, to the Ukrainian people. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. You know, Julie, the, uh, uh, we completely reject uh, a referendum patched together uh, in a few weeks with uh, Russian military personnel uh, basically taking over Crimea. Uh, we reject its legitimacy. It is contrary to international law. It is contrary to the Ukrainian constitution. Uh, I know that we've heard from uh, the Russian Federation uh, this notion that uh, these kinds of decisions are often made in, in other places, uh, and, and they've even analogized it to Scotland or uh, you know, uh, other uh, situations of that sort. Uh, it, in each of those cases that they've cited, decisions were made by a national government <coughs> through a long, lengthy, deliberative process. Uh, it's not something that happens uh, in a few days. And it's not something that happens with an outside army uh, essentially taking over the region. Uh, as you just heard the Prime Minister indicate, uh, you know, the people of Ukraine recognize historic ties with uh, the people of Russia. Uh, the Prime Minister you just heard say, repeat what he said uh, often, which is they're prepared to respect all international treaties and obligations that they are signatories to, uh, including Russian basing rights in Crimea. Uh, the issue now is whether or not uh, Russia is able to uh, militarily dominate a region of somebody else's country, engineer a slapdash referendum, uh, and uh, ignore not only the Ukrainian constitution, but uh, a Ukrainian government that includes parties that uh, are historically in opposition with each other, including, by the way, the party of uh, the previous president. Um, so uh, we will not recognize, certainly, any referendum that goes forward. Uh, my hope is, is that as a consequence of uh, diplomatic efforts uh, over the next several days, uh, that there will be a rethinking of the process that's been put forward. Uh, we have already put in place uh, the architecture for us to apply financial and uh, economic consequences to actions that are taken. Uh, but our strong preference is uh, to resolve this diplomatically. And uh, as you heard the Prime Minister say, uh, this idea that somehow the Ukrainian people are forced to choose between good relations with the West or good relations with Russia, economic ties with the West or economic ties with Russia, uh, is the kind of zero-sum formulation that uh, in the 21st century with uh, a highly integrated global uh, economy uh, doesn't make any sense uh, and is not in the interests of the Ukrainian people, I actually think in the end it's not in the interests of uh, Russia either. Uh, Russia should be thinking about how can it work with Ukraine uh, to further strengthen its economic ties and trade uh, and exchanges uh, with Europe. Uh, that'll make Russia stronger, not weaker. But obviously Mr. Putin has some different ideas at this point. Uh, we do not know yet what uh, our diplomatic efforts will yield, uh, but we'll keep on pressing. In the meantime, the main message I want to send is uh, that we are highly supportive of a government in Kiev that is taking on some very tough decisions, is committed to uh, law and order, inclusivity, committed to the rights of all Ukrainian people, and uh, is committed to fair and free elections that should settle uh, once and for all any questions uh, that there may be about uh, uh, you know, what's transpired since uh, former President Yanukovych uh, left the country. Uh, and 
the most important thing to remember is this is up to the Ukrainian people. It's not up to the United States. It's not up to Russia. It's up to the Ukrainian people to make a decision about how they want to live their lives. Uh, that's what all of us should support. Uh, and, and certainly that's uh, the reason that why I'm so pleased to have the Prime Minister here today. Mr. Thank you very much.